Hey everybody, I'd like to welcome you to Squires Pond in Hampton Bays on the shore of the Peconic Estuary. We're here for our Day in the Life of the Peconic River program. This is a program that's been going on for the last eight years. And given the unusual circumstances of today with the pandemic, many schools are not allowing their students and teachers to go out on field trips. And so rather than lose a day for data, collectively we decided that our, our group of experts would come together and collect the data that the students could then use. My name is Mel Morris. I'm from Brookhaven National Lab. I'm one of the co-creators of the Day in the Life of the River Program. Hi, I'm Melissa Perrot from the Central Pine Barrens Commission and one of the co-coordinators of this great program, and it's great to be here today. Ron Gallardi with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm an environmental educator. Hello, my name is Aleida Perez from Brookhaven National Lab. I'm Pete Topping with Meconic Baykeeper, and we're a uh, nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and preserving the Meconic and South Shore estuaries. Hi, I'm Sarah Schaefer. I'm the program coordinator for the Peconic Estuary Partnership. Um, we are an EPA-funded uh, national estuary program. Hi, my name is Adele and I'm from the Peconic Estuary Program. Hi, I'm Sharon Pepinella and I'm an educator at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory DNA Learning Center and manager of the high school student-driven research program Barcode Long Island, which studies Long Island's biodiversity. Okay, so we're doing group one tide measurement right now. Um, and the purpose of this group is to measure the tide to see if it's rising or falling over the course of 30 minutes. So every 10 minutes, we set the timer and put a flag down um, where the tide is at that time. Um, so at the end of 30 minutes, we're gonna come back and measure the distance between each of the four flags and then the total distance between um, flag one and flag four. All right, so it's been 30 minutes, and as you remember, when we got here, we set the first flag and have been setting the remaining flags every 10 minutes. Um, as you can see, the tide is falling, um, and we're going to measure the distance between flag one and flag two, flag two and flag three, and flag three and flag four. And I'm going to read it off to Melissa. So the distance between flag one and flag two is 16.5 centimeters. The distance between flag two and flag three is 10.5 centimeters. And the distance between flag three and flag four is 3.5 centimeters a total distance of uh, 30.5 centimeters. So the next measurement we're going to make right now is the current speed. And the current is a combination of several factors. Part of it is the tide, the moon pulling on the water. Part of it is the slope of the river bottom. And then part of it is, is just as the wind is blowing as well. So what we've done here is we've thrown a floatable device into the water. In this case, it's an orange. And we'll time that for 60 seconds. At the end of 60 seconds, we'll measure the distance that it's flown. All right, so we just threw the orange for the first time, and it traveled the distance of 29.2 meters. We're going to throw it for two more times and determine the distance that it goes for 60 seconds, and then we're going to determine the average of that um, distance to find that to find the current speed of the um, stream. Okay, so now we're going to determine the air temperature for the day. And the air temperature is really important because it'll determine what biodiversity we see and also our water chemistry factors, okay? So it's, it's gonna be beautiful today, we hope. But right now, it is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit and you can determine what the Celsius is. All right, so now we're going to estimate the cloud cover. There are four options here. The clouds can be either clear, partly cloudy, mostly cloudy, or overcast. So today it's pretty easy. It's obviously overcast, which means we have about 75 to 100% cloud coverage. All right, so now we're going to measure the wind speed, and we're gonna use this handy device, which is called an anemometer, and it has um, blades in the middle here that rotate when the wind hits it, and then it shows you the wind in miles per hour. So I'm just gonna hold this up into the wind, and we've, oh, it's gusty. 
eight miles per hour. So now that we have determined how strong the wind is blowing, we want to find out what direction it's blowing in. So when we measure the wind direction, we want to um, figure out which way the wind is coming from. So if you face into the wind, that's the direction of the wind. And we're going to use this flag and hold it above our head so that our body blocks it. And you can kind of see that the wind is coming from that direction. Now, the next thing we're going to do is um, figure out how uh, choppy the water is. So um, we're going to look out over the area and see if there are any white caps breaking in the water. And if there aren't, um, we're going to call it rippled. All right, so now that we have given you the wind direction and the choppiness of the water and the wind speed, you should be able to use the table in the classroom to figure out the Beaufort scale from that. Right, so we are doing group two, which is our site description. And if you look behind me, this is Squires Pond. And what it is, is a tidal pond. So we, uh, we saw with the orange floating before, the current's going out right now because the tide is going out. When the tide comes back in, salt water from Great Peconic Bay will feed back into this system. Um, we also have back behind those trees, uh, we have fresh water coming into this pond from the ground. So as we move further up into this pond, we would expect the salinity or level of salt in the water to drop a little bit. And that's gonna open up different habitats for different types of organisms that we might not find in the bay. Uh, behind me, you'll see all this green, um, this lush green meadow. This is a salt marsh ecosystem. There's a lot of stuff going on here because you have fresh water, you have salt water mixing, um, and you have forest along the edges. So we're gonna find a lot, of, a lot of characteristics to check for this area. If I reach, reach down, there is definitely a lot of sand here. Um, I do not see any bulkheads. So bulkheads are uh, usually wooden structures that are along a shoreline that people um, put to prevent erosion. Uh, is this area vegetated? Um, it's definitely very natural. We have all, all these salt marsh grasses here. Uh, we are not near a road ending. Um, rocky, not really, but you might want to might want to notice that note that there are some smaller rocks present in the area. Um, pipe entering the river bay. No, this is a very very natural area. Uh, gentle slope, and that's pretty much what I what I see in this area. Um, it's actually one really, really unique area because this is what um, what our natural environment would most likely look like without a lot of human interaction. So this is a very, a very pristine area. Okay, so the next next thing we need to do is characterize the river bottom here. And when I when I pull out a a little bit of sediment here. Um, I would say that it is mostly sandy. There are some smaller pebbles in the area, but it's going to be it's going to be very very sandy overall. Uh, the next next question is, what percentage is covered in vegetation? Um, from the surface, you might not see much, but if I reach down into the water on some of these small rocks, we do have macroalgae or seaweed growing. Um, so I would estimate in this in this area maybe about 25 percent uh, coverage coverage with this al algae. Um, surface vegetation uh, we we don't see anything. The surface is is barren. The next part is the map site, and clearly we're not going to draw it for you. But we're going to give you everything you need where you can draw that. We're giving you the Latin long, so you can go onto Google Earth or Google Maps and determine um, where we are. And you can also look around from this video and uh, draw a map of what you see here. So have fun doing this, you artists. All right, so we're doing the long site turbidity meter here, and we're going to use this to figure out the clarity of the water in this site. So we're going to do this three, three times at three separate locations. And what you do is you um, take your tube and you fill it up with the water at the site all the way to the top. He's going to do that. Make sure to hold the bottom hose 
closed so that the water doesn't come out the bottom. And then so I'm going to look through the top and see if I can see the secchi disc on the bottom. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly let out water from the tube and uh, that will allow us to determine the level that we can see. Yep. Okay, stop. So I can see the secchi disc, so I'm going to read off the measurement. Um, we're at 1.08 uh, meters at this site. We're going to attempt to get a sediment core to sample what below the water line itself. We're going to do this here in the creek, and because it's really rocky, uh, the first attempt may not work. I'm going to use this long plastic PVC tube, and I'm going to try to drive it into the sediment. Uh, because it causes a vacuum, it'll allow us to pull out the core. Uh, I'm concerned that I'm not going to be able to penetrate the rocky bottom, so I also have a small metal uh, device that will be able to grind deeper in with the stones. So I'm going to give this a try. So as I feared, this was um, too rocky for us to really get very deep. So uh, I think we're going to abandon this core and I'm going to try the metal core. Okay, this one we can measure. And then I don't see any anoxic sediment whatsoever. So, uh, we are going to do a habitat association survey. So this is basically when you use uh, animals or plants that grow in a certain habitat to uh, basically figure out some of the more characteristics, uh, to find characteristics of the area. Um, so if we come down, here uh, we have, this is called Spartina, and it's one of the predominant uh, grasses that grow or define our salt marsh ecosystems. And what these do is they anchor down the sediment, and usually if you dig right where, right where these are, you'll see that, that sand or the, or the soil changes a darker color. Um, so these are really important organisms because they actually trap nutrients and uh, sediment that comes off the land and keep it from going in the bay. Um, and uh, in turn, these, uh, these grasses provide habitat for, for other organisms. Um, and speaking of which, if we look right down here, I have to zoom in a little bit, there's a hole in the ground right here and little bits of sand coming out of that. And that hole is uh, from one of our local salt marsh crabs. Those are fiddler crabs. Uh, you might have seen them. They have, the males have a very large claw. Actually, oh, I think I might have one in my pocket. Um, nope, I don't. <laughs> uh, we'll keep an eye out for them. Um, we might see them, some of those on the walk. All right, moving, um, moving up. Inland a little bit, we have our cord grass. It's also called uh, disticus, so that grows higher up in the marsh. And it's a really cool site because we have a kind of a sharp incline right here. And as we move up, we have seaside goldenrod. Um, it's at the end of its blooming cycle, but uh, it has very uh, abundant yellow, bright yellow flowers. So that's an important food source for our monarch butterflies when they're migrating down south. If we move up a little further, we have, this is called uh, groundsel. Um, it's a, 
plant that grows, it characteris characterizes the high marsh. Uh, so you can see it's getting sandier up here, less sediment. Um, and then lastly, as we move all the way up on this dune, we have our beach grass. Uh, you don't find them, this type of habitat as much around the bay. It's um, a little more dominant around the ocean areas, but this area in particular has a lot of sand. And then further up, uh, it's a little distant for the camera, um, but we'll move into some of our shrubs and that's gonna be characterized by plants uh, such as bayberry and also beach plums. Right, let's see what else, what else we can find. Good, um, this is a good area right here. Uh, we also have another another plant that grows in this area. This is uh, called sea lavender. So earlier in the season, it has a uh, a purple flower on it. And this is one of my favorites right here. Uh, this is called <clears throat> salicornia or pickleweed. And this plant, it actually um, one of the uh, problems that these plants have to deal with is they're growing in areas with a lot of salt and plants don't like salt water they want fresh water so these plants have to figure out a way to get rid of salt and you can actually chew on that um, and it's actually an edible edible plant and it's actually really salty so it's called pickleweed because it tastes a lot like a like a salty pickle let me see if I can He got away. Um, you can see in this area here, we also have a nice open sandy spot, and we see an abundance of these fiddler crab burrows. So the fiddler crabs will come out and pick up little bits of uh, debris that get trapped in the salt marsh. So these these marshes again, uh, these grasses trap trap sediment, um, and then organisms that coexist or live in this ecosystem. Uh, take advantage of that and they come out and they eat, eat bits of food and then they bring it down back into the sediment and in their burrows. So they're a really important compo component of our salt marshes. It's, uh, I don't want to step on too much grass here, so we'll bone the half. All right, next I'm going to step right into the water here. Um, and then as, as we transition in from, from the salt marsh here into our water, we're going to find uh, bivalves or shellfish growing. And one of the most common inhabitants of our salt marsh ecosystems from the, uh, from the bivalve class are these ribbed mussels. And what these do is they attach uh, to the uh, salt marsh grasses, they use these bissel threads. It's almost like a super glue fiber. They attach and then they open up when they're covered with water and filter feed uh, some of the algae that's growing in the water. And they're also gonna provide a really important food source uh, for organisms um, like blue crabs that, that like to live in these tidal, tidal systems. Uh, another type of organism, or um, this is a, a gastropod or a a type of snail. These are our slipper shells. And if we look at the underside there, uh, that's the animal itself. And their foot is like a suction cup. And what they do is they hold on to these rocks. And then when the water is flowing, they actually open their shells a little bit. They pop off the rock and they actually capture particulate matter that's coming by. So to continue with our habitat assessment, uh, I just can't stop talking about it because everywhere you look, there's something cool. This is very low tide here on the Faconic Bay, and it really gives you an opportunity to see some species that are typically underwater. There's a variety of bivalves, including oysters, scallops, and some mollusks, a variety of snails, including the slipper snail. That And as far as bird species, in addition to what Pete said, uh, cormorants are here. I identified at least five cormorants 
um, so far, and we've been here just over an hour. So we'll keep you up to date on the rest of the species we ID before the end of our time here. But keep in mind, this is such an important assessment to include each year when you do this. It's easy and fun to do the say net, which we're going to do in just a moment. But it's also very important to see what animals and plants are not in the water, right? That live on land, that live in the sky, because that represents the site equally to the aquatic biodiversity that you identify in the same net. So um, let's go see if we get. So now we're doing the aquatic biological survey. We actually did two sample sites at this location. Historically, the school that visits this site has two separate teams, and one is in the Peconic Bay, which is what we're watching now and the other is in the creek that is the outflow from Squires Pond. Just like before, we pick all of the organisms out of the net and sort them before measuring. The diversity of the two locations was different, perhaps because of the salinity or because of the current. While this is not an uncommon animal, this is our long-clawed hermit crab that was caught in between the snail shells to protect it. So here we see one of the experts measuring the organisms. This is at the Creekside sample carefully holding the animal down without harming it, making sure that it and the measuring board is wet. In this case, we have the metric scale on the side of a clipboard, which works just as well as a ruler. The mummachog here measures about 77 or so millimeters long. We're gonna move on to the other species of fish we caught in abundance, and then to our invertebrates. Hermit crabs aren't really able to be measured because you're really measuring the length of the shell, but they're still interesting to catch and definitely need to count them. This species is a brand new one. It's never been caught before in any of the sampling days. So we were pretty excited to see this feather blenny in the Squires Pond Outlet Creek. A bottom dwelling fish that loves shellfish beds. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alida, I'm with my colleague Sharon. And this is group four. We're looking at the chemistry of the water. It gives us an indication of the, you know, of the health of the environment that we're seeing, uh, that we're uh, testing today. The first uh, uh, chemical that we looked at is oxygen. So we look at the amount of the soft oxygen that is in the water, indication of how much oxygen is flowing or is present in our environment. We did this in triplicates, and we did it three times. And as you can see, uh, we're gonna show you the result of one of them. And if you can see next, we can see that it's at about, about eight parts per million at least. About eight parts per million at least. So they give us that's a good number, it's a good indication of oxygen. It's a very nice level of oxygen that we find here in our water. Right. So the next text, test that we did in our waters here in Pepeconic, it was the pH. It tells us about how acidic or how basic our water ways are. So we're going to demonstrate one of the essays for you. We take about a uh, tube here and we will add about 10 milliliters of water. Um, and then the water, we did this three times and uh, we had a, we picked three different sections from the river area that we are testing today. Okay, we're almost there. And then we add a tablet to that. It's a very quick test and it's a color change. And the beauty of this test is that we have a colometric chart that by matching the colors that we see, it tells us, it gives us an, uh, uh, a good indication of the pH of the water that we have here today, okay. I'm going to ask my good friend Sharon to put a tube in there because she has nice gloves. We don't want to touch the chemical. 
and look at that. We're gonna close and we're gonna mix it by inversion, then back and forth, back and forth. It's a very quick test. And we have seen about a pH of seven in most of the samples that we have today, and that this looks like it's no different from what we have seen so far. And we have a colometric chart. All right. Now we pair up, and it's about seven, uh, pH seven in our waterways here on the Peconic. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about are the nitrates and the phosphate levels that we measured in these water samples. Now, nitrates and phosphates are really important for aquatic growth, so aquatic vegetation and algae growth, uh, but too high a levels of nitrates and phosphates can be bad for the aquatic environment because what that means is you can get unchecked aquatic plant and algae growth. This means, this can lead to eutrophication. So this is a process by where you get overgrowth of these uh, plant and algae and die off of those plants as well. And what that means is it can lead to a decrease in the overall dissolved oxygen level in the water. And this is bad for the other organisms, such as the fish and the aquatic invertebrates that live in those environments. So it's important that we keep these nutrients in check because it's important for the growth, but we don't want too much of those nutrients. And what we're seeing from the samples that we collected today are low levels of the nitrate and low levels of the phosphate. So you can see that we've got just about five parts per million or, or less than five parts per million from all three of the samples that we collected uh, for our nitrate levels today. Uh, and then for our phosphates, it looks like we've got about one to two parts per million of phosphate levels in the water samples. So this is good. And this makes sense because we're seeing a high level of dissolved oxygen. So it makes sense when we have a high level of dissolved oxygen that we're gonna have lower levels of the nitrates and the phosphates in these samples. So what we're seeing is a relatively healthy ecosystem here. I mean, it's an important factor uh, it determines the kind of fish animals, and plant life that can live in the body. Now, this is an estuarian environment, so the salinity actually changes as the tide comes in and the tide comes out. And the squire's pond empties out as more fresh water, and it fills up because it gets salt water. So the animals that live in this kind of environment are, are quite hardy. They can tolerate wide ranges and fluctuations of salt water. So we're going to measure salt water two different ways, salinity two different ways. One of them is an instrument called the hydro, uh, refractometer. Refractometer <coughs> pictures the fact that salt water has a different refractive index than fresh water. And so what we can do is we, we put, put the sample on the screen, we look through the, the eyepiece, and we'll see a screen in here that has a blue field. When we put the sample in here, that blue field will raise or lower depending on where the salinity level is. The first thing to do is to clean it with distilled water, get rid of any previous samples. Then using a dropper, just put some salt water on here, close the cover so that it, it spreads out throughout the, the glass, and then look up light. And this salinity sample is 1.05, I'm sorry, 1.015 here. That's the specific gravity that measures is 1.05. Now an alternate way to do this is to use a home fish tank or aquarium salinity measure. And this works on specific gravity as well, and it just has a little float that could float at different levels depending on the salt content of the water because that changes the density, which changes the specific gravity. Well, thank you for joining us today. It's been fabulous. Peconic Estuary is such an amazing ecosystem because you have the South Fork where we are, and then you have the Peconic River, and then you have the North Fork. So typically we have schools all up and down the North Fork, the river in the South. So today it's us on the South Fork, but I have to give a shout out to Shoreham Wading River, who's at Indian Island County Park. They were able to do it with a, sh a small group of kids. So we're um, really excited. We'll get two sets of data. 
Um, we are hoping that all of this we're doing here uh, you can utilize in your classroom. And we did collect most of the data, but we are allowing you to do a lot of the formulas as well, like the Beaufort scale, uh, Fahrenheit to centigrade, etc. So you'll have some work to do. So thank you for letting us be part of your journey. This has been great uh, to be in your shoes for one year and see how fun it is and exciting and how hands-on learning is just so, um, it's easy. And uh, we just love this program so much. So thank you and hopefully next year we'll all be together again doing this.